We were very fortunate a few years ago uh, in stealing him away from the University of Chicago. And uh, he has done a wonderful job in our lab and he will be telling you about uh, the work that he's doing currently in our uh, translational molecular lab. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Craig McKinnon, I work at NCW. And I'm going to talk about next generation sequencing. And um, th this is one of the most exciting and significant technologies to hit the path lab in, in probably the last 30 years or so when PCR first came out. And um, as pathologists, uh, we're really in a fortunate place because we work with cancer and the cancer genomics is just booming right now. There's all kinds of efforts to catalog almost every kind of mutation that's in a wide spectrum of tumors. And we get to encounter these on a daily basis. And next generation sequencing allows the ability to assess these tumors in a cost effective way and it's being increasingly adopted in labs uh, all throughout the world and through the United States. And as more and more discoveries are made in cancer, finding mutations that are actionable and drug targets are being um, developed against them, there's going to be a bigger need to analyze tumors to find rare variants. And so it's a really exciting time. So, so what I want to talk about during this session is four broad areas. One is talk about the role of next-gen sequencing um, in a clinical lab, uh, briefly go over the different type of genetic variants that are found in cancer, uh, talk about the technology and the data analysis. This is a real um, interesting and challenging part of adopting this into a lab. And then talk about clinical applications in the reporting. Sorry about that. Um, so as you know, um, can't, uh, there's a large number of clinically actional variants in tumors, and these variants are found across a wide spectrum of tumors. Um, and it's important so to link up the variant with the tumor because that allows clinicians to identify the right drug for the right patient. And central to all of this is cancer genomic testing. And a good test for doing this uh, has to be able to assess many variants in a single test, uh, detect actual variants that occur at a low frequency, so rare variants, um, work with FFPE tissue, uh, be done in a CAP CLIA compliant manner, uh, minimize or false positive results, and have fast turnaround time so the patient and the clinician get the information rapidly. A great example, something we're all familiar with, would be lung cancer. A group of patients who with non small cell lung cancer, indistinguishable at the histological level, but with molecular diagnostics, it allows the patients who are EGFR mutation positive to be separated from the patients who do not have EGFR mutations because these patients respond better and do better with targeted therapies of frontline versus conventional chemotherapy. So the, the advances in DNA sequencing starting around 2005 when these instruments called next-gen sequencers of massive parallel came out just exploded such that the output from a lab became massive. And at the same time, the cost of doing sequencing on a per nucleotide basis dramatically plummeted. So we've entered a new paradigm in testing. Previously, we had the kind of single gene, single assay model that was based on dideoxy sequencing or Sanger sequencing. You got 900 base pair reads, and um, it worked very well, it's very sensitive, but it was limited by the narrow range of targets, one gene, one assay. And the fact that due to cost, um, cost uh, considerations and other issues in the lab, you kind of had to do one gene at a time. You did your testing, you got your result. If it wasn't informative, you had to do another test. Now we're, we're entering this new era where we're at the massively parallel, so it allows you to do many genes in a single assay. This is highly cost effective, it's time efficient, and that's all due to the fact that you're doing all your testing in parallel. So the benefits of next gen sequencing to a clinician, to a clinical uh, point of view, is that decision making is now better informed. You have the genotype of the tumor, the targeted therapy can be more appropriately selected. It's faster. Uh, you don't have this reflex testing that may have uh, delayed the definitive result in the past. And it allows for the better use of, of the newer targeted therapies, which are incredibly expensive and only work in subsets of patients. From a lab point of view, this is a, a, an opportunity to start to cons consolidate your testing on a single platform. Uh, that's easier to train your technicians, it's cheaper to do your service contracts and all the things that involve with operating equipment. Uh, it's more sensitive technique. You can find mutations at a much lower frequency than you can by conventional methods. Tissue samples can be limiting, so you don't have necessarily the option to do test after test after test. This, because it's in parallel, potentially one test will give you your answer. 
and you can detect rare yet clinically significant variants. So the human genome has about 3 billion base pairs, and all of us share almost all of our genetic materials identical. But there's about 3 million base pairs that are different between individuals. And these differences are help to explain the variation in people at their susceptibility to getting cancer or getting the disease and how they respond to, to drugs, different drugs. And next generation sequencing allows us to pick up these different types of variants. So I'd like to review um, just in a few minutes the different types of variants that underlie the oncogenic transformation of tumors. And they can very generally be characterized into four categories. At the single nucleotide level, which is simply a base pair change, these are called single nucleotide variants. SNPs are ones that you inherit and ones that you acquire with the single nucleotide variants. An example is the single nucleotide variant that underlies the BRAF B600E mutation. You can also have insertions and deletions of nucleotides. These can be very small to very large. An EGFR deletion and exon 19 is an example. Structural variants come in basically two flavors, small and large. The small ones would be um, chromosomal rearrangements or translocations. Uh, sometimes you don't have gains or losses of material. EML4 ALK in lung cancer is an example. And then copy number variation. This would be duplications of large sections of chromosomes. A HER2 would be an example of that. All of these have the potential to be captured and identified with next-gen sequencing. Uh, copy number variation is probably the most difficult. It's not completely adopted or, or, or doable with instrumentations, but the rest of them are. So um, a single nucleotide polymorphism, these are sites located in the genome, there's about a million of them across the genome. And at, at, at a specific site, um, there's the possibility exists that one of four different nucleotides can be present. Uh, typically it's only one of two nucleotides, and you have a minor one and a major one. And these are not necessarily disease causative, they can be linked to diseases. And were early on, and um, when microarrays were popular, were used to do um, linkage studies. But they can very often be benign. And to be what's called a SNP, that's the term, or how these are abbreviated, they typically have to be in greater than one percent of the population. Now, now these these at the molecular level are identical to mutations, except two things distinguish. Them. Well, one thing definitely distinguishes them, and that's their prevalence. These, by definition, an arbitrary cutoff, are in 1% or more of the population, while well, mutations are rare, less than 1%. Mutations are typically acquired in your life due to your exposure and your underlying um, DNA repair and things like that. These are acquired, whereas these typically you're born with. You can be born with mutations, but most of the tumors we're talking about are acquired. So these would be um, at prevalences of homozygous or heterozygous, but these are rare in your tumor. They're a rare fraction of your alleles. And so this would show you how you can find a heterozygous individual by sequencing. At this position, there's a mixture of A's and T's and an equal distribution, three A's and three B's. So this patient would be heterozygous for a mutation at this position. The consequence of these single nucleotide variants ranges from nothing that you have a nucleotide change, but it doesn't change the amino acid that's coded for. This is called a silent mutation. And these are typically filtered or parsed out by your bioinformatics when you're analyzing the sequencing data because these are thought to be non-pathogenic. But then the ones that can cause problems are either missense mutations, and there's a nucleotide change uh, is accompanied with a change in the coding sequence. So if an arginine amino acid now becomes a histidine, um, they can become nonsense in which a premature stop codon is introduced. This causes a truncation of the protein, typically loss of function. Or it can destroy a stop codon, so you get read through it. Now you get a weird protein that's not normally made that has extra amino acids, which can either knock out the function or give it a new function. Uh, another class of mutations frequently determined by uh, connection sequencing are called insertions, deletions. These could be very small. I mean, this is an example of a three nucleotide deletion, so this would not disrupt the codon frame. Or they can be insertions. Uh, lastly are structural variants and copy number variations. These can be uh, balanced translocations, which will create fusion transcripts, like BCR able, leading to a fusion protein or chimeric protein, which has, it's like Frankenstein, two different proteins fused together that, that acquires a new uh, malignant uh, ability to turn cells into, uh, into cancer. Or it can be big chunks of a chromosome, like this one has the MIC-N locus. They're just amplified, causing overexpression of a protein that drives transformation. 
And sometimes these amplifications aren't necessarily on the chromosome, they're floating free in the nucleus. And these are like double minutes. But the point is they're overexpressing a protein that at high levels is dangerous to the cell. This is difficult to detect with necessary sequencing as of now, but uh, tools are being built to detect this. So and I'm going to get into more what I mean by amplicon, hybrid capture, whole isome, whole genome. But with next gen sequencing, depending on what you're trying to sequence, they all do a very good job at detecting single nucleotide variants and small insertions and deletions, which are a large percentage of mutations found in cancer. Uh, if, you, if the structural variant is known, you can design assays to, to pick them up with the different approaches. But again, as I just mentioned, these larger changes are, are more difficult and we're not quite there yet. So when we talk about next gen sequencing, we're basically talking about a technology that has the ability to massively parallel, sequence in parallel millions of DNA templates. That, that's, the, that's the whole foundation to it. And, and they call it next generation sequencing or second or third generation sequencing in reference to the first generation, which was Sanger sequencing, which is still a workhorse in most labs. It's a very powerful technique, but it was the first method of doing high level, long sequencing readings. And these advancements that led us to the second and third generation sequencing were really driven by innovations in sequencing chemistries, uh, imaging, high, high resolution imaging, the microfabrication of nano, nano level size uh, materials to, to do your DNA uh, manipulations, and mostly through advances in information technology. So, so this kind of is the basic idea of next generation sequencing. You, you create a library for your patient sample and generate thousands of, of molecules that you sequence. Then all these uh, sequencing fragments are through, through a computer program mapped to a reference sequence. And so what you end up with are short overlapping sequence reads mapped to a reference sequence. And from that, the computer extracts the final sequence that it reports. The first next-gen sequencing machine was called the 454. And, and this is actually the first really commercially available machine that first started to find its way into the clinical lab. There were machines that were before this, but they were more kind of geared towards researchers. But the, the, the big breakthrough came in 2005 by the 454. And over this time, different companies have come out to, with different instruments. And right now, uh, most labs are using instruments made by Life Tech of Ion Torrent or by Illumina called the High Seek and the My Seek. And these are the two most popular ones that labs use. And these, all these instruments, though, rely on two major principles. They rely on a polymerase-based clonal replication of a single DNA molecule that is spatially separated on a solid support matrix. So you take all your targets you want to sequence and you spread them out in some type of solid support matrix that allows them to be isolated. And then through a series of cyclical sequencing chemistries, you can derive a sequence. And so each platform is defined by the method used to achieve these two processes. So I'll focus only on PGM and MySeq. These are the ones that are, are used in a lot of uh, clinical uh, labs. They're, they're, um, their desktop, they, um, they, they can fit on a bench. The PGM has a bunch of parts to it. It's about, it's about seven feet of space. The MySeq is a simple, small unit. It's about three feet of space. Uh, they take about one or two days to prep your library, which is what you load on the machine. And then the runtime ranges from two hours to maybe several days, depending on how big the, the read is. But, but what they both share in common is they use a disposable. The, the PGM, which is what our lab uses, uses different chips, and these chips are basically sized. So that the smallest chip, the 314, would be like a minibus. You could put um, 15 people on it and take them, so you could do that level. This would be like a school bus, it could transport more people, and this would be like an airplane. So it's basically the capacity of the sequencing you want to do, and of course there's a cost associated to it. They get more and more expensive, the bigger the chip. The MySeq is kind of analogous. They have this uh, cartridge right here where you load your sample, and they come in a range of sizes as well. And these are disposable, whereas the instrument is, is not disposable. So um, the PGM works by on this chip, and basically what you do is you create a library, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. And the library is basically a bunch of DNA molecules that are all clonal, they're all the same oligo from, from your patient stuck to a bead. These beads, there's millions of these beads that are loaded on a chip, and they land individually in these little wells. And it's in these little wells where the sequencing reaction takes place. And as nucleotides are added and incorporated, they release a hydrogen ion. That's just part of the polymerase um, uh, process. And this thing is basically a little transistor, a little, little electronic 
capacitor that can measure the production of these hydrogen ions because it creates a current. And then it takes the change in the current and creates a basically a, a, a micro level pH meter. And that is transferred to your sequence or translated into your sequence. The MySeq works very much the same, but the molecules are distributed over the chip. But instead of using a pH change or semiconductor type method, it uses different fluorescently labeled nucleotides. And with each addition of a nucleotide, you get a different color. And then a camera takes a picture, and all this big stack of images are then uh, deconvoluted, and you get your sequence. So different chemistries, totally different setup, but very analogous. A MySeq and a PGM are kind of like a Mac or a PC. They're different, but they're very much equivalent at like getting your job done. It's just you have personal preferences or maybe specifics why you like one better than the other, but they're both very equivalent to each other in cost and in performance. So when we sequence uh, tumors, th there's some issues that come into play that don't happen when, you, when you're looking at constitutional changes. And that's the fact that the tumor is heterogeneous, uh, the tissue's heterogeneous, the tumor might be on one side, and even within the tumor, you're gonna have a mixture of malignant cells with normal uh, stroma, blood vessels, other things that have normal uh, DNA sequence. Um, so it's heterogeneous. So when you're looking for a, a variant, it can be challenging because the variant can be at a low frequency. Um, and in fact, even within a tumor, your mutation may only be in some of your malignant cells. So when you're looking for, for variants, the level of mutation might be very low. So you need a very sensitive technique. And one way this is overcome with this massively parallel technique is through, a, through what's known as coverage. So this would be an example, let's just say this is the KRAS gene. And there's two positions in the KRAS gene that are potentially oncogenic. One is in exon 2 and one is in exon 5. When you do your sequencing run and you pile up your sequence reads, you can see that this A, located in position 2, was sequenced by eight independent fragments. See, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this was called 8x coverage. Whereas at this end of the molecule, there's less coverage. This could be due to secondary structure or a bad assay design or some problem. And this T was only sequenced three times. Now this is just simply an example of this idea of coverage. When we sequence tumors, we're, we're usually sequencing up to 500 to, one, to 1500x. So each one of these positions has to be sequenced over 500 times. Therefore, when you have a low mutant allele frequency, maybe only 10%, you're sequencing it 50 times. And that's hopefully enough to get above just the basic error rate that's gonna happen in any asset. So the two major things that are involved with your sequencing is to create a library that you're gonna put on your machine. And this can be derived in some labs, like at, at Mount House, Wisconsin, in the pediatric department, they're doing whole genomes for children that are born with birth defects. You can maybe just fish out only the coding region of the genome, that's called the exome. What we do is we just basically have a user-defined list of genes we want to sequence because these are most likely to play a role in your patient's tumor, or they're ones that actually make a difference clinically. Um, and you can also sequence RNA. And then we look for these different types of variants we talked about previously. So what, what, what a lot of labs are going with are panels. Uh, this is a panel that's designed for the PGM, which is the one type of instrument we talked about. This is another panel that's designed for Illumina. And you can see when you look at the list of genes on this panel, so these are genes that will all be sequenced at once, they're, they're nearly identical, with the exception of two genes that are on the PGM panel that are not on the Illumina. Uh, these genes are all specific driver mutations for the tumor. They're clinically actionable and they give prognostic or predictive information. The advantage of doing a, a kit like this is that it's less expensive, the, in, the information technology requirements are lower. Uh, this is off the shelf, you can just order from the vendor. You can also customize it. Let's say there's a gene that one of your oncologists is doing a clinical trial on that he really wants you to include. There's no problem just to go ahead and add that to this panel. Uh, the turnaround time is quite fast and the interpretation is really a lot easier. But the disadvantage of this approach is that if there's an important gene that's not on this panel, you're not going to sequence it. Um, in addition to sequencing DNA, RNA panels are now coming out. This might be very useful when you want to, let's say you have to do a fish assay in addition to a DNA sequencing assay. There's a lung fusion panel that's, been, that's commercially available now that includes the ALK, ROS, RET, and NRTK1 gene. So this could replace potentially doing fish, or it could be a screen because these are rare, that you can find out by this and then do for fish to confirm it. Sarcoma panels are coming out, right now there's some that have 26 genes on it. And then there's a very 
uh, useful in, in hematological malignancies. So this would be an example of lung cancer. Uh, this lists some of the mutations that are very important to ascertain now uh, for using therapy with erlotinib or rosotinib or thabrafinib. All these are approved for lung cancer. Um, in the past, we had to do a single gene, single assay model, potentially many tests because these not, aren't that common, some of them. Uh, multiple platforms, you maybe have to do an immunizer chemistry, fish, or sequencing. This could take a long time. Now with these panels, you take your tumor block, extract DNA, RNA, you can do that at the same time, put on your machine, and run your two panels at once. So you can do all your sequencing and look for Ross Red and Alk uh, trans, uh, sorry, um, translocation variants at the same time. So the workflow in a, in a molecular lab would be you um, capture your targets, and, and um, this is the DNA from your patient's tumor that's going to go into the assay. You build this library. So the library is what you're going to sequence that was derived from your patient. It goes on to the sequencer, and you run your sequence, then you analyze your data, ultimately to generate your clinical report. Now, this is not trivial, going from the sequence to the final report. It is a very, and this is what's known as the bioinformatic pipeline. That's the term that's used. Uh, this is a highly complex process. It has multiple analytical steps. You're handling really large amounts of data. Your data files are big. And it depends on many programs and databases that have to be cross-referenced. And um, this really was a major problem for early adoption of next-gen sequencing through the clinical labs and why it took a little bit of time to, to really become mainstream. And a lot of tools were created to support this process. So the, the, the actual raw sequence data analysis can be broken down into five major steps. One is your quality assurance step. This is just making sure, is the reads coming off my machine high quality enough to, to interpret and act upon? Then you have to take all your reads and align them to a reference genome so that you can define what these variants are. And then you identify your variants. This is called variant calling. Then once you find a variant, you have to annotate it and describe it so that the clinician understands what it is and can act upon it. Then you have to somehow create a report that can very efficiently and in a user-friendly manner convey all this information. And this is really the bottleneck of analysis because this is a highly structured and sophisticated pathway of doing your analysis. And, um, and the challenge of just calling a simple variant uh, is not trivial. Um, things that can confuse and give you false negatives or false positives include artifacts from your PCR amplification or the way you're building your library. Uh, machines introduce sequencing errors at some rate that you have to be able to identify and throw out. Uh, they can be incorrectly aligned. Tumors are heterogeneous. You might, for some reason, miss, it, uh, miss an allele or, or have a problem there. And then you can always run into problems with contamination. But through all these processes, there's the major outputs that are most important uh, for, for analysis is the creation of a BAM file. This is your final, highly structured, total sequence that's coming out of your patient's tumor. And then the BAM file is filtered to, to generate what's called a variant caller, caller file, or VCF file. And this tells you the variants that are identified in your tumor. Now, this is where the, the pathologist and the clinician do their work, is you take this variant caller file and you have to cross-match that to your knowledge database, which says, all right, my patient has a BRAF B600E mutation. This is why that's important. This tells me that my patient will respond to vimorafenib. And so all the variants need to get cross-matched to this clinical database to create a clinical interpretation. And from there, it's this information is dumped into the clinical report. So in its very most primitive sense, a VCF file could be your report, but it doesn't have any of the annotation that's needed to make it clinically meaningful, clinically useful to an oncologist. So what's, we've been fortunate enough now to smooth away from all these different programs that can be used to handle each one of these steps, which I would refer to as first generation data analysis pipeline, into ones that are now built into the system. So on our IM Torrent and our, our PGM and our MySeq, these assembler and variant callers are built in. So that data is now coming off the machine. And this is really what's ushered in the, the, the adaptation of this technology into a lab like a lab that where I work, because that previous stuff would have been beyond my capabilities to do. Now this is a lot easier and a lot more accessible. I think a lot of people are realizing this. And then there's still third party or open source software that allows you to go from variant calling to annotating your mutations. 
So this is what a DCF file looks like. It's just a long list of your variants, and it tells you the allele that, that, that's, that's um, being detected in your patient's tumor. Other alleles that might be found, if, there, if, the, if the sequence passed the filter, if it's a high quality or not, and then the percent of that this allele is patient, present in your patient's tumor. So in a nutshell, it gives you this information. BRAF gene, this T at position 1799 is now an A. And the consequence of that is your patient has a B600 E mutation. So fortunately, software now can take this and automate this, this data analysis pipeline. So in a way, we kind of have a next generation of data analysis software. Um, but this is, this is a new frontier for clinical testing because this bioinformatics pipeline or this analysis needs to be clinically validated like in a CLIA cap way. And these are all issues that come into play with this validation of this software. Uh, the tumor cellularity, sequencing depth of the region, of the variant, the allele fraction, the quality of your sequence, and the strand bias, all these can influence how your bioanalysis pipeline interprets the data. And so these need to be um, validated. Fortunately, a lot of the vendors who are selling the software to do this for you and have the documentation so it's not something that you would be forced to have to handle. So we've made a trans, uh, 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 there's been a, uh, a progress from taking raw sequence and reads and manually doing each one of these steps down. That was manual analysis that was just beyond the scope of most clinical labs, unless you happen to be at a really big cancer center that's been doing this type of work for a long time, because it required a big expert bioinformatic team and major IT infrastructure. Uh, now, today, there's no problem just to get the, the variant calling file off your instrument, do your own manual interpretation of each variant, and write your report. But now, there's software coming out, which, we, which our lab has decided to go with, called clinical workbenches. And they basically allow you to go from your raw sequencing data to your reporting and generate a draft report for you that then you can preview and sign out, or confirm and sign out. So I would like to um, spend a little bit going over the idea of validating this whole process. And there's three aspects of the validation. The platform. That was basically what type of sequence are you going to use? You have to validate the performance of this piece of equipment, just like you would with a new IHC scanner. You have to validate your assay. Are you going for whole genome, whole exome, or targeted? And then validate your informatics. And we're using a product by a company called Genome Oncology for our informatics. So there's a um, uh, working group called the Next Generation Standard of Clinical Testing that took the performance characteristics that all labs have to follow. Uh, for any assay, accuracy, precision, sensitivity, specificity, your ranges, and define what aspect of the next-gen sequencing pr testing process uh, applies to the different parameters. So you know for accuracy, this is what they mean when they talk about accuracy. And so this is now giving us firm guidelines to use to validate our assays. And so some general criteria is you have to know when you're validating an assay, you're validating, okay, I'm validating a gene list. I have a list of 50 genes I'm going to validate. That's all I'm going to be focusing on. And I'm only going to report single nucleotide change, insertions, deletions, and I'm not going to mess with copy number variation. I'm going to work on solid tumors. I'm going to work on FFPD samples. And my tumors have to be at least 5% tumor content for me to even run on my own instrument. So these are the types of things you define up front as you enter your validation process. And really key to all of this is the retaining reference material. And the, I, the best case sample you can get is if you're going to do FFPE tissue, it's a set of FFPE uh, reference standards. And, and actually Horizon Diagnostics is a company which sells a set of reference standards called QSeq. And that's what I'm going to talk about on the next slide. But some other alternatives would be commercially available genomic DNA that might have been used in the Thousand Genome Project. This one is really well characterized making your own oligos and spiking them into normal DNA, or and then taking various combinations and pooling them, diluting them, and all that to, to do your type of validation. So what we did is we purchased FFPE engineered blocks that contain different mutations, and they've all been uh, diluted down to 5% allelic frequency. And then by pooling them, you can get down to very low allelic frequency. And this covers 40 different oncogenes, and there's, they're either deletions or single nucleotide variants. And by sequencing them, and we know what they should be, we look at what we get. It allows us to determine the sensitivity of our assay. And then through a whole bunch of different kind of permutations, by, uh, by taking these blocks and mixing them and arranging them, 
we have been able to uh, develop our validation plan for testing our reproducibility, the, the, the ability of our sample to, to detect variants in FFPV versus fresh DNA, the precision, uh, how well the different chips can run next to each other, and our reportable range is really a DNA concentration. And so by using six chips and building nine libraries, we can perform this in about a course of a month. And when you do that, you get all these metrics. And then you can calculate the positive predictive value based on these metrics. And take these positive these metrics and then put them into your quality QC module of your software. And then when you then you run your patient samples in the validation. And using these QC metrics, you can then validate your sample on a patient on patient samples. I'm sorry, let me say that again. You can validate your assay using these QC metrics on your patient samples and then validate your assay and go live with it. So once you've done that and your assay has been validated, you now are at a point where you can go through the patient sample, run it in your lab, generate the data, generate a report, and then give it to the clinician and the oncologist so they can work on, work on it. And so with the genome oncology software we use, and this is not plugging them, there's other people that, that have these same types of things, this software basically serves two purposes. It works like an LIS, allowing you to track your specimens. You can session them, do your orders, and report the results. But it also handles all that bioinformatics, and it's completely integrated. So with our LI, for using this genome oncology software, it allows us to, to enter the sample into our, into our lab, create a run, picking what type of sample it is and what, what tests we're going to do on it. And then when the data comes off, it's a modular analysis pro process. Uh, we've taken all of our uh, configurations from our validation, and that allows us to uh, to, to identify and call our variants. And then an excellent feature of, of this type of process is what we call the rules. And that's taking a variant that you've described and associating it with a clinical rule. I have an EGFR exon 19 deletion. That's associated with positive response to erlotinib. And so therefore, these variants now have a clinically useful piece of information tagged to them. And this is part of this workflow. And then you finally come up with your report. So this is a completely integrated approach. Creating these rules, what happens is you get a variant that's identified and it's given the proper nomenclature, like BRAF B600E, and then there's a, there's a specific way that these things are described. And then that, once it's in that format, it's queried against an external reference database. And these include databases called COSMIC, which is the Catalog of Somatic Mutations of Cancer, Polyspend, different databases. And then the user defines the significance based on ACGME guidelines. And once you've done that, you can then say, all right, every time I get a BRAF E600E, I'm going to stick this rule on it. But you may find, all right, this, this, this rule only applies in melanoma, but not in colon cancer, and so on and so on. So that by doing that, you can set up your software so that when you encounter these variants, it will assign the rule automatically. And so I, I like to think that this, this workflow is, is highly analogous to a cytology lab where you get your smear, the technicians do the smear and make sure there's cells there, and then cytotex will go through and dot the scary looking cells so the pathologist can just focus on those. It's the same thing here. The lab manager uh, takes the case, enters it to the LIS, and then analyzes all the QC metrics to make sure, yes, it did work. Then it goes to a genomic analysis, and this could be a tech in the lab, it could be the pathologist, it's not a dedicated person, but it's a role that a person plays. What they do is they validate, classify, and annotate all the variants that are identified and create the draft report. This comes to the pathologist who reviews all of this, agrees or disagrees, signs off or signs on, and generates the final report, and then it's somehow communicated to the clinician or the oncologist. That would really either require interfacing with your hospital's electronic medical record system or just emailing, faxing, or downloading the report. This whole process for a case using a small gene panel, like a 50 gene panel, it takes about 30 to 40 minutes to work its way through here so that you take your raw sequencing data off the machine and generate your final report. So the final report really, at the end of the day, is what you're showing the rest of the world. This is, this is really the most important part of, of what you've done. I mean, all that QC and stuff is really important within the lab, but no one's going to know about it. The report is important, so it, needs, so it has to have several major features to it. The summary page is basically a high-level summary of the variants. And the variants are categorized by their significance for the patient's disease. And, you, and it has to have an interpretation of the significance. 
make it meaningful. And then we'll include additional sequencing and technical details on subsequent pages. So for patients who've seen the CARES Target Now or the Foundation Medicine Reports, it's modeled the same way. And for us, we, we, we categorize five levels of significance. The most significant variance that we described first would be alterations found in the patient's tumor that are um, that would have targeted treatment in that patient's cancer. So if it's a melanoma, you find a V600E mutation in the BRAF gene, then that patient is known that they respond, or likely to respond to vimeraphimib. Secondly, the alterations with reported target treatments in other cancer. You find a HER2 new amplification in lung cancer. Well, trastuzumab isn't typically used in lung cancer, it's used in breast cancer, but your patient has a HER2 mutation in his lung cancer. Maybe that would be useful information for the clinician. Then, another thing would be variants that might not be targeted now, but they can be put the patient on a clinical trial. So these variants, when we're doing the rules, they're matched and, and, and queried against clinicaltrials.gov. And so all clinical trials that are available for this patient's variant could be listed here. Or you may just want to only list the clinical trials that are taking place at your institution, or within your state, or within your part of the country. You can filter how extensive this list is. Then lastly, you're going to find variants, but no one knows what they mean. They, they, they haven't been, they could mean nothing, or they could be important, but we just don't understand it yet. So that is uh, listed as a fourth level of significance. Then lastly, and a feature I think is very important, is you're going to list genes that on your panel fail to generate in sequence. Say, for example, KRAS, no sequencing data was generated. If you read this report, you may think, oh, the patient's wild type or does not have a KRAS mutation, which is very different than, no, we, we never even were able to ascertain the status of KRAS. So that's an important uh, piece of information to, to convey there. Then you can reflex to a backup test for the KRAS if for some reason that's important. So in summary, um, next-gen sequencing technology can identify somatic driving mutations in sporadic cancers. It can also find germline variants in hereditary cancer syndromes. The next-gen sequencing allows multiplexing of actionable driver genes for a cost-effective, accurate, and sensitive assay. Advances in NGS technologies and bioinformatics are leading to a, a cost reduction, making this more and more accessible in the clinical practice. And the clinical validation of next-gen sequencing assays is complex and labor-intensive, but it follows the same basic plan you would for any type of assay you bring on your lab. And uh, the bioinformatic barriers are the most challenging part of this whole process. So that's all I have to say. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you.